God, we thank you so much for your presence. Lord, we thank you that you show up. God, that you're just not everywhere all the time. God, you are everywhere all the time. Lord, but you show up with your evident presence, God. Lord, we can feel you. We can encounter you, God. We know that you are here. We know that you're in us and that you're with us, God. We thank you so much, Jesus. Lord, that you desire to come into this world. Lord, you didn't consider it robbery, Father, to leave the throne of heaven and to come to this world to be like us. Lord, to be beaten, to be sacrificed, to shed your blood, Lord, so all people can be saved. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Lord, that we can stand before you this morning. Father, righteous and holy and blameless before you. Lord, call your sons and your daughters, enjoying the glory, the splendor of your presence, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, for all that you do in our life. Lord, we give you glory. We give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Legacy Church. We're grateful that you're here with us today. You know, we just sang this amazing song that God shows up. He wants to come. You know, and his desire is for all people to know him. Not just some that are called or predestined or predetermined to be saved as some believe that, you know, there's certain people that can be saved and the other people, it's just, you know, they're just existing. No, the Bible says that God wants all people to be saved. Every single person that we know, who we encounter, who we see, who we don't know, God wants all people to be saved. And that's amazing to me, that there is no lost cause, that there is no person that's too far gone. God can save every single person. And as we sang, he can walk through any wall, every, any chain, any burden, anything, God is able. We believe in a God at Legacy Church that is still performing miracles, that is still healing, that is still delivering, that is breaking chains. We believe in that kind of God that the miracles that Jesus did did not stop with the disciples. That healing did not stop with the disciples. That that is something that belongs to every single believer. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, that belongs to you. Healing belongs to you the same way that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for our salvation and forgiveness of sins. He shed that same blood so that you can be healed. And so every morning, every Sunday morning when we gather together, we pray for our friends to be saved. We also pray for everybody that is here and those that are watching online and the people that we encounter, that healing would come into their bodies. And so we believe in a God that is a healer. And so this morning, if you are not feeling well in your body, I would just ask you to raise your hand. We understand that we as believers, we carry the Spirit of God within us. And that the Spirit of God that is in us is able to do exceedingly more than we can ask or think through us. And so if that means to pray for somebody for healing, God can do that through us. And so if you are here right now and you're not feeling well in your body, you can raise your hand. If you don't want to, that's all right. Everybody is well, that's good. So if you have any family members or people that you know that are not well, we're going to lift them up to the Lord, and we're going to just declare wholeness and healing into their body. And we're also going to lift up every person that we know, that we encounter, that is not yet saved, that does not know the Lord. And we're going to pray for them that their eyes would be open to see and their ears to hear, their heart to be softened to the voice of the Lord so that they can receive them into their life. Amen. So God, we thank you so much. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you for the power of the cross, that on that rugged cross, on the cursed tree, Lord, that you want a victory for me. God, for the people that are around me, that the blood that you shed was not just for my forgiveness, but for the healing in my body. Lord, so this morning we stand upon the victory of the cross and we just declare healing into our bodies. We declare healing into our family members and we just say every sickness, every disease, every infirmity that binds people this morning, we just command it to go in Jesus' name. We just command the wholeness and the fullness and the Spirit of God to come and to fill those bodies right now in Jesus' name. Father, we receive your healing this morning by faith, Lord, for everything that you've done for us, Lord. 
Father, we thank you for that. Lord, and right now we also lift up every single person, God, that we know and that we've encountered, every, the first people that we meet, Lord, in our families, in our jobs, in our schools, wherever we are, Lord, those people that do not yet know you, but God, your heart, it burns for them, Lord, to answer your call in their life. God, to answer, Lord, to your voice and acknowledge you as the one true God. Acknowledge you as the one true King and Lord of their life. Lord, we ask, God, that those blindfolds over their eyes, God, that they would be lifted, Lord, so that they could see your truth, see your light, God, that their ears would be open to hearing your voice and their heart to be softened, Lord, to receive you, to recognize, Father, their condition and their need of you, God. Lord, we ask you in, in your name all of these things. God, and we thank you that you hear our prayer, that your desires for all to come to know you. Jesus, that there would be nobody left on the sideline. God, that when they hear your truth, they would respond to you. Father, we thank you, God, that you called us into your marvelous light. Lord, we open up our hearts this morning, our minds today. God, our spiritual ears. Lord, as we hear your word today, God, that it would sink into our mind. Lord, penetrate our heart and bring transformation that today as we leave this service, that we would never be the same. God, I thank you that you're able to do exceedingly more and abundantly than we can even ask, think, or imagine. Lord, you are a great God. You are an amazing God. Lord, and today as we seek you, we're seeking with expectation that we will find you and that you have something for us this morning. God, we honor you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Legacy Church. Do you guys and girls, do you feel like the presence of the Lord this morning? Wasn't that like an amazing time of singing together and worshiping God? I don't know if some of you have had a good week or a bad week, but I do know that God wants you to have an even better week next week. I truly believe that. I want that for you, and if I want that, our loving Father wants that for you even more. Thank you for everybody that's tuning in online. I'm speaking to you. We're, we love that you're here and that you're watching with us. We'd love for you to come and join us sometime. So there's this one book that I started reading, and I've been reading more and more books recently, but this one book, oh, by the way, you can have a seat. I see some that have sat down. That's it. I won't make a stand. This book, outside of the Bible, if there's only one book that you're going to read in your lifetime, I'd love to invite you to get, grab a copy of this book and start reading it. It has started working something absolutely amazing within me. And I didn't realize how many offenses I've been harboring in my heart. You can go to church and you can harbor offenses towards the people that you are even sitting next to at church. And it's decaying your body. It's decaying your health, your soul, your mindset. And you may just be going through the motions and saying, you know what, it's not a big deal. I'm just not gonna talk to that person but you still hold that offense in your heart. There's so many negatives to this. I found one article which is really amazing. When we hold on to grudges and resentment, you probably heard this, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to get sick. So, they may not even know that you're harboring an offense toward them. Some of the people that I harbored an offense toward, they might not even know. They'd be walking around and they think everything's fine and, and I'm okay toward them. But the truth be told was, I was holding something against them. And this causes us to carry negative, tense energy in our body. Living in a chronic state of tension disables your body's repair mechanisms, increasing inflammation and the stress hormone cortisol in the body. Forgiveness engages the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps your immune system function more efficiently and makes room 
for feel-good hormones like serotonin and oxytocin. If you are tempted to dwell on an offense, remind yourself what you are doing to your body and when you run the scenario in your mind again. Because you see, your brain doesn't know what is real and what is imagined. When you replay in your mind an experience you had six months ago, a month ago, a week ago, your body reacts as if you're having the same experience over and over again. Proverbs 17, 22 sums it up right here. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. A crushed spirit, when we are holding offenses towards somebody, that is crushing our spirit. That is crushing our bones. Y'all want to know what this book is? I'm just making sure you're paying attention. I heard one yes. That is somebody paying attention. I love it. Thank you. Written by John Bevere. It's called Bait of Satan. Mind-blowing. I, I can't even believe it. Like, I'm already, I just started this, what, last week? And I'm halfway through, more than halfway through. And, and God's just reminding me of all these offenses that I've been holding in my heart. And I'm just like, God, take them away from me. And John Bevere talks about how to let that go because it's a process. we got to work on it. It's not snap a finger and they're gone. I wish it was that easy. But God gives us the grace. He gives us wisdom to work through it, to let go and love the person, and to forgive. Verse 3 of the song, Love, no, love Knows No End today. I will love for you have loved. I will forgive as you forgave. Amen? Little Legacy, you are dismissed. I know everybody has their phone. You know the drill. Best part about service, giving back, being a part of community. Phone numbers on the back, text. Anybody? No, nobody's looking at their phones. I want you looking at your phones. This is the one time it's okay. We love you guys. We have a super amazing, special pastor here visiting from Down Under. His name is not Crocodile Dundee. It is the one, the only, Pastor JJ Jack Jens. Ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome. Come on over. Thank you, bro. Wow, let's stand to our feet and let's give Jesus some glory this morning. Come on. Would you lift your voice and pray? Father, we thank you for what you're going to do this morning, God. Father, we thank you for hearts open. Father, we thank you that your transforming power will penetrate our heart, God, and empower us to live a life of power. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place this morning. We welcome your kingdom and your governments. We welcome your authority. We welcome all that you want to do, Lord. Father, we ask that you would wreck this service. God, that you would change our life and you'll do what only you can do. In the mighty name of Jesus, everyone said, amen. Hey, turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is good. Turn to your other neighbor, your second choice, and say, hey, you bet your sweet biscuits, Jesus is good. <laughs> Come on. Well, guys, it's such an honor to be here uh, this morning. Uh, we're, uh, my wife and I, she's on the front row here, Lily, she's, uh, we're from Philadelphia. And uh, come on, Philly, God's moving mightily in the East Coast, amen? Come on, I, I feel like for so long we've looked at the things of the West Coast. I'm like, man, God's moving mightily, but I tell you what, God's about to move so significantly on the East Coast, it's gonna blow your, it's gonna blow your box, I'm telling you. So get ready, because God's got something amazing in store. But we are, we're serving in Philadelphia right now. I'm part of a Slavic Russian church. Um, it, it's amazing to think that an Aussie, Australian, uh, would be at a Russian church, but God has amazing plans. And it's been such an honor and a privilege to minister in Philly and just watch what God is doing. Uh, but yes, I'm originally from Australia. Uh, I was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia, and I uh, moved when I was 19 years old uh, by myself to the United States. I felt the call of God, and in the midst of that, I met Lily in Australia, and you know what? When she met me, she got born again again, and so we're like, hey, we have to make this a thing, so we got married, and so we're a powerhouse for Jesus. Come on. <laughs> I, I want to tell you an Australian joke. Are you ready? What do you get when you cross a kangaroo and a sheep? You get a woolly jumper. 
<laughs> Come on. Awesome. Lord, may it land. Father, may the revelation of that joke become truth in our life. <laughs> Come on. Well, guys, um, as I was praying and asking the Lord what he wanted me to speak on today, uh, I really felt in my spirit that the Lord had a word, a message for you uh, that was regarding returning back to our first love. Um, you know, sometimes in life we get so caught up in things that are happening or things that have come against us or even a fence that has built up in our heart that we begin to gaze at another lover and we miss the true lover, which is Christ Jesus. And so today the assignment that I have is to present a message from the kingdom that will call you back into the secret place with Christ Jesus. And I pray that as I speak, it's not just mere words, persuasive words, but I pray that it comes with a demonstration of power, that you feel the weight and the anointing on what I say, that you can walk out in the manifold glory. And so I want you guys to have a heart open, and I shared this at the conference on the first night, but I encourage you guys to operate and function in hunger. The more hungry you are, the more that you receive from God. And so I pray that even though that I'm a new face and I'm a young man, that your heart would be open to receive from the Lord. Because it's not about a minister, but it's about Christ Jesus. And you know that a minister is of God and he's anointed when he's all about the Lord Jesus. And I pray that our life would represent that in all that we do, that we would be ones that sit at the feet of Jesus and we gaze upon him, that we truly walk in the revelation and the understanding of a love relationship, a love affair with him. It's all about him. He'll change your life. Before I get into the sermon today, and we're going to be reading uh, through Matthew 4, and uh, the, the title of my message is, An Encouragement in the Midst of a Wilderness Season. And I felt that some of us in this room have found ourselves in a place that we're being distant from the voice and heart of God. Some of us may feel like we've been in a wilderness season where it's been dry, where it's been a season where we felt distant and detached from reality. And so today I actually want to speak into that and speak a word of confirmation and a word of encouragement of how to be connected to the Father when we feel like we're walking through a wilderness season. Before I dive into this, I want to share this with you. For me, I, I didn't grow up in a Christian family. I didn't have a, a mom and dad that, that loved the Lord. I actually grew up in an abusive home. I grew up uh, at the age of two. My mom and dad got a divorce. Uh, my dad went ahead and, and started another family. I got remarried, and it was just me and my mom. I was a young boy, and at the age of five years old, uh, my mom got into a relationship with a man that was quite abusive, and this is in Melbourne, Australia. This man was so abusive that he actually would beat my mom physically in front of me. They would get into disputes and arguments, and uh, this man would actually uh, brutalize my mom. In my house, we had a room that was designated just to growing marijuana. This man stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from my mom uh, through cars, jewelry, a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, he actually was growing marijuana in our house to say, I'm going to repay. And so he was trying to repay through evil. And so I grew up in an extremely abusive home, you know, a home that no young man, no young woman should go through. And at the age of six years old, I was in my bedroom one night, and this is when the Lord Jesus came in. I was in my bedroom, six years old, and I was laying there, and I was going to go to preschool the next day, and I was just praying, and I was like, and I was thinking, and I was like, God, you know, I feel so distant. I don't feel loved. I don't feel valued. I'm so scared to leave my mom, because I felt like I was my mom's biggest protector. And so I'm laying in bed just thinking about how I'm going to leave my mom the next day. And I remember in the midst of this moment, I had two beings walk in my room. They were around seven foot tall, and now I know that they were angels. I had angels walk in my room, and they carried this blue electricity that was wrapped around them. And as they stepped into the room, I felt the blue electricity wrap off them and rest on me. And to this day, I know that the blue electricity that was manifested in my room was the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit rested on my life at six years old. And for the first time, I felt peace. I felt rest. I felt joy. I felt completion. For the first time in my life, I felt loved and seen by a father. At the age of six, God started to pursue me. God started to rock up in my life to reveal how good he is and how amazing he is. In this process of God pursuing me, God was also pursuing my mom. One day she was walking down the streets and she was getting groceries before she went to work. And as she was getting groceries, a man ran up to her and said, hey, can I pray for you? 
And she said, hey, I don't need prayer. I, I need counseling. I need a lawyer. I need money. Like, I need an intervention. I, I don't need God. And he persisted, and he said, no, let me pray for you. Just a simple prayer. And she gave in to be kind. She's like, okay, you can pray for me. This man ends up laying hands on my mom on the streets, and he prayed a simple prayer. He said, God, would you intervene in this woman's life? God, would you come in and radically rock her with your love and your affection? And so she was like, great, thank you for the prayer. The man handed her a business card, a, a connect card, and said, hey, when God intervenes in your life, call me. And we'll go from there. She's like, okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> Went off on her way. She's in her car driving to work. And while she's in her car driving, the presence of Christ Jesus enters the vehicle. And she has a radical encounter with God. She has a peace that surpasses all understanding. She has a fulfillment, a completion. The very spirit that visited me in my bedroom was the spirit that visited her in the car. It was Christ Jesus. So she ended up going to work, and then she came after work, and she's like, hey, I need to go and visit this pastor. She called the pastor and said, hey, I need to come and meet you. God met me. I got radically transformed. And so my mom goes and meets his pastor, and he, she, uh, he starts to minister to her, and she gives her heart to the Lord, and she gets born again. From there, we grew up in the church. Come on, isn't God good? God will intervene in your life. I'm telling you, God wants to radically rock up in your life that you don't have to live a boring, mundane Christianity. God wants to roll up in your life so that you don't have to just do the same thing over and over again and go, God, when are you going to show up? When are you going to break through? The truth is, is that God wants to break through in your life more than you desire for him to even break through in your life. God desires to be in your presence more than you desire to be in his. He's a loving father, and he's chasing and pursuing you. And so, hey, man, like, what is your gaze upon? Is it on Jesus, or is it on other things? Are you trying to do things in your own strength, or are you depending and resting on God and saying, Lord, here I am, I surrender. Come and use me, come and fill me, come and dwell in me. And so from this age, and I, I'm preaching my testimony, and we'll get into the scripture in a moment, but I feel like there's just a weight on this. And so just receive this before we get into some passage of scripture. But I want to speak this over your life because I believe it carries an impartation. And so we grew up in the church, and uh, well, I grew up in the church from the age of six. And I remember as I was getting mentored and poured into by uh, fathers and preachers in the church, at the age of 12, I actually went on my first ministry trip uh, as a uh, uh, I went on my first youth camp uh, to a youth uh, group that was part of my church. I think I was like 12, 13. And as I'm at this youth group, the Lord started to download on my life. He said, I love you. I adore you. You've been accepted and proved. It's about nothing that you've done, but it's all about what I've done. And the Lord said, now I want you to go and make disciples. I want you to go and preach the, go the gospel. And so I was at this youth camp at the age of 13. And the Lord speaks to me and says, Jack, go to the back of the room. There's a girl at the back of the room, and I want you to pray for her. And so I end up being obedient to the Lord. I go to the back of the room, and there, lo and behold, is a girl on the back uh, wall laying there during worship. And so I go up to her, and I said, hey, why are you laying here? God told me to come and pray for you. What's going on? She says, I've got scoliosis in my back, and I'm in extreme pain. And so I'm not, during wor I'm not participating in worship because I'm in so much pain. And so I said, God told me to pray for you. I, at this stage, I'm 13 years old. I don't have a qualification. I didn't go to Bible college. All I had was an encounter and experience with Jesus that qualified me. You know, some of us are waiting for permission. You've already been given the permission. You've been given the right through the cross to step into your God-given destiny. And so I laid hands on this girl, and the Lord spoke to me and said, Jack, I want you to command healing. And so I spoke healing in her body. Nothing happened in the moment. I walked away. I said, God bless you. The next morning, she's jumping and shouting at the front. Come on. She grabs the microphone boldly. She's like, I just want to grab the microphone. And she gets up on the stage, and she says, last night, I was at the back of the room. And Jack came up to me and prayed for me. When he left, I fell out under the power of God. I had a vision of a river. This river touched my body, and I was completely healed. She received full healing out of a 13-year-old from a broken family. If God wants to use a 13-year-old from a broken family, how much more does he want to use you? There's no excuse. The only thing that we allow to block us is that when we remove our gaze from him. 
We need to be in the posture of just Him and Him only. It's not about a performance. It's not about trying to make stuff happen. It's just about abiding in Him, resting in Him, and allowing Him to flow and function out of you. I've seen the greatest miracles in my life when I didn't try to produce anything. When I just rest and I abided in God, He decided to flow through me. God is looking for a surrendered heart tonight, this morning. God is looking for a surrendered heart to say, Lord, would you intervene in my life? Would you be willing to fill me? You know, something that's really significant about the wilderness season is that we look at it as a trial and a tribulation. But the wilderness season is actually at the place that bears much fruits. You know, we feel like that a wilderness season, a time that's tough, that's in suffering and pain, like my testimony in the beginning, we look at it and we go, man, that would, uh, uh, that's a rough season. There's no way that there could be fruit in that. It's a defining season. It's, it's like a trial and a tribulation. This morning, I want to speak truth into you and say this, is that the, the, the fruit doesn't grow on the mountaintop. The fruit grows within the valley. It's in the valley that God can define you. It's in the valley that, that, you can be, uh, that you can have diamonds produced out of the dust, that you can have diamonds produced out of, the, out of the dirt. It's in those places of the valley that God can speak life into it. But here's the thing, is that when it comes to a valley season, a season where you are in the wilderness, there's two ways that you can do it. You can do it without leaning into the presence of God and having your gaze upon Him, or you can do it in the presence of God and having your gaze upon Him. And this is a significant difference. The difference is, is that if you just do it without the presence of God and without a surrendered heart, you're going to do it in your own strength. You're going to do it trying to produce your own fruit. You're going to try and get out of the season and not realize what God wants you to learn in the season. Now, I'm not saying that God's sending bad things your way. But what I am saying is that God wants to use all things for the good. God wants to use your darkest season, your valley season. God wants to use your mountaintop season and experience for His glory. But the only way that it can bear much fruit is if we abide in Him. Are you getting this this morning? Am I speaking to someone this morning? God wants you to bear much fruit. God wants you to go deeper in intimacy. And that's one thing that I absolutely love about the valley season. The season of being in the wilderness is a season where you can go deep in intimacy with the Lord. You know, if you find yourself in this place, that's the time to seek His face like never before. That's a time that you should set a massive priority in your life to be with Him intimately every single day. You need to have those moments that can give you confidence and boldness to get through, but also give you the eyes to see and the vision to know why you're in the season. And so I pray that you would receive a revelation today of bearing much fruit in the season of the wilderness. Would you turn to me? Let's jump into Matthew 4. I'm going to read this amazing uh, passage of Scripture. And uh, before Matthew 4, in Matthew 3, we see that Jesus got baptized and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. It says the heavens opened and the dove ascended upon him. The Holy Spirit ascended upon him in the form of a dove. And when the Holy Spirit ascended and rested on Jesus, he was then empowered for the ministry. And then it says the Spirit of the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit, led him into the wilderness. And so we're going to read in Matthew 4 of how Jesus has entered into the wilderness. You guys ready? Come on. So verse 4, it says this. Afterwards, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the lonely wilderness in order to reveal his strength against the accuser by going through the ordeal of testing. And after fasting for 40 days, this is verse 2, sorry. After fasting for 40 days, Jesus was extremely weak and famined. Then the tempter came to entice him to provide food by doing a miracle. So he said to Jesus, how can you possibly be the son of God and go hungry? Just order these stones to be uh, turned into loaves of bread. And he answered, the scripture says, bread alone will not satisfy, but true life is found in every word which constantly goes forth out of the mouth of God. Then the accuser transported Jesus to the holy city of Jerusalem and perched him up at the highest point of the temple and said to him, if you're truly God's son, jump and the angels will catch you, catch you, for it is written in the scriptures. He will command his angels to protect you and they will lift you up so that you will never or you won't bruise your foot on a stone on a rock. Once again, Jesus said to him, the scripture says, you must never put the Lord your God to the test. 
And the third time the accuser lifted Jesus up into a very high mountain range and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all its splendor that goes with it. All of these kingdoms I'll give to you, the accuser said, if only you kneel before me and worship me. But Jesus said, go away, enemy, for the scriptures say, kneel before the Lord your God and worship him only. Verse 11 says this, and we'll finish with this, this verse. At once the accuser left him, and angels suddenly gathered around Jesus to minister to his needs. Amen? What I want to do this morning is I want to unpack this scripture in Matthew 4, this passage of scripture. And I want to reveal to you a, a prophetic word, a prophetic unction that the Lord gave me that he revealed through this passage of scripture. When I was reading this uh, several months ago, the Lord said to me, this is a great definition of how to remain in a place of connectivity to the Father in the midst of a wilderness season. Who knows that the, the enemy came to tempt Jesus, came to accuse him, but the enemy always overplays his hands. And so when the enemy overplays his hands, you know his strategy and you know what's most important. You know, the enemy most of the time will attack you in the area that you are called to be in. You know, if you're called to be in a place of even being a father or a mother to a generation or pouring into people, the enemy will accuse you and attack you to steer you away from that calling. You know, some of us this morning have been so attacked, so bombarded by the thoughts of the enemy that the enemy has actually got in and tried to persuade you from God's destiny on your life. And I pray that that would be broken because the enemy knows that if you step into your divine calling, if you step into what the Lord's asked you to step into, then you're unstoppable. Then you're going to kick in the gates of hell. Then you're going to see the lost saved. You're going to populate heaven and you're going to plunder hell. The enemy knows that when the church rises up and steps into what God's ordained for them, he's lost the battle. And so as I was reading this passage of scripture several months ago, the Lord said to me, the enemy has overplayed his hand and tried to accuse me, Christ Jesus, and I'm going to reveal how this actually points to us being in connection with the Father. I believe that the enemy came in not just to accuse Jesus' identity um, and, and to persuade him from, from that, but I also believe that the enemy came in to try and disconnect him from the assignment that God had on his life. Amen. And so I want to bring this, I want to pull this apart. The first thing that I see in this passage of Scripture, the first temptation, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down. The first temptation is that the enemy came to Jesus and, and asked him, said, hey, if you're the son of God, and why are you going to go hungry? Just order these stones to be turned into loaves of bread. And he answered and he said this, Jesus said this, bread alone will not satisfy, but true life is found in every word that constantly proceeds out of the mouth of God. The first thing is this, in a season where we find ourselves in the wilderness, we need to be feasting upon the Lord. We have to build and establish an altar where we feast on the constant word that flows out of the mouth of the Lord. We see in Exodus with the Israelites when they're in the wilderness, God provides manna for them every single day, fresh manna. And the old manna expired. Why? Because the Lord was speaking and saying, I do not want you to live off yesterday's manna, but I want you to live off today's, the fresh revelation, the fresh word from heaven. You know, some of us today, this morning, have been living off testimonies that happened five years ago. Some of us have been living off encounters and words from the Lord that you received personally that happened 10 years ago, happened six months ago. But who knows that God wants you to remain in a place where you're constantly hearing his voice and you're constantly receiving fresh revelation. In a wilderness season, we cannot live off old manna. We have to live off the fresh word of God that proceeds out of his mouth. Because that's the only thing that's going to satisfy you is his word, is his bread. You know, some of us try and find bread in different things. You know, we look at different places and different spaces to try and receive a fulfillment, but there's nothing that will fulfill you greater than just going directly to the source. You need to create an intimate relationship with God. You can't live off your parents' relationship with God. You can't live off your spouse's relationship with God. You need to develop your own intimacy with the Father. You need to develop your own history with the Lord. And so I see in this passage of Scripture that Jesus was very bold in his statement to the accuser, and he used Scripture, and he said, listen, bread alone will not satisfy. 
You know, the, the, the manner and the things that have happened will not satisfy. But what will is the word of God that is spoken in the now moments. You guys hearing me this morning? We need to establish an intimate place with God. It's the only way. If you don't have an intimate place with the Lord, that's when you're going to lack confidence in your calling. That's when you're going to be, be easily steered away. And that's when you're going to be influenced by what the world is trying to offer you. You need to be in connection and connectivity with Him. Your life will be transformed. You getting it this morning? Come on. So the, the second accusation, the second temptation that we see in this passage of Scripture is that the enemy goes ahead and, and pretty much tempts Jesus' identity, you know, tests his identity. And it says this, the enemy said to, to Jesus after transporting him uh, to the holy city and perched him on the top mountain, says, if you're really God's son, jump and the angels will catch you. For it is written in the scriptures, he will command his angels to protect you and they will lift you up so that you will never or won't uh, bruise your foot on stone. Once again, Jesus said to him, the scripture says, you must never put the Lord your God to test. The second thing that I see in this passage of Scripture is that the enemy came in to accuse and tempt Jesus' identity. In a wilderness season, in a season where we find ourselves in need of connectivity with God, we need to know our identity, church. Do you know who you are? Do you know whose you are? Do you know that you are a royal priesthood? Do you know that you are beloved and adored by God? Did you know that what God instilled in you is something that he cherishes and he's been thinking about from the foundations of this earth? There's no one in this room that is insignificant. There's no one in this room that is higher or greater. Everyone in this room has been perfected and loved and adored and are designed by God. You are a royal priesthood. And the scriptures say that the same power that lives in Christ Jesus, that raised him from the dead, now dwells in you through the Holy Ghost. You are a powerful church. You're not a powerless church. You're a powerful church. And you have the grace on your life to transform the world around you. I'm just feeling this in my spirit right now, but there's some parents in here, some people that have been praying for salvation in your family. And I just heard the Lord say this on this word, that the power of the salvation is in Christ Jesus that lives within you. And as you speak truth and as you pray, the word of the Lord is gonna go forth and it's gonna produce salvation in your family. And so if that's you, just receive that this morning. You are the answer. Jesus has given you all in him. You are complete in him. And I think it blows our box to, to have this revelation of, wow, in Christ Jesus, I'm made perfect. In Christ Jesus, I am now righteous. In Christ Jesus, I have been made in connection with him that nothing can divide that. Church, you're powerful and you're in connection with God the God of the universe. You know, if you can kneel before Jesus, you can stand before anyone. If you kneel before him, you can stand before anyone. You know, some of us are called to the political space, the business space. Some of us are called to carry wealth. Some of us are called to preach on the platform or minister internationally around the world. The truth is, is that God has given you everything you need to fulfill the assignment that he's called you to. You're not lacking the scripture said, you shall not want. Why? Because you have the fullness of everything that you need in Christ Jesus. The moment that we feel like we are empty and we don't have it is a moment that we've turned the gospel from a focus of Jesus to a self-centered gospel. The moment that we start to think that it's in our strength and, or it's in our lack of strength is a moment that we've missed the point and we've directed our gaze away from Jesus. We need to know who we are. And we need to believe and stand firm on our identity. You know, some of us in the room may feel like we're being attacked with our identity. We've been attacked with our worth in Christ Jesus. You know, ways that you can combat this is by declaring who you are on your over your life. Ways that you can combat this is by reading the Bible and seeing what the Lord says about you. Ways that you can combat this is allow people to speak into your life to give you encouragement of the identity that you have in Jesus. A way that you can combat this is put on your mirror all the declarations of how God sees you. So in every morning that you wake up, you can just prophesy and speak into existence that you are bold, that you're courageous, that you have the power of God in you and you can accomplish all things. The enemy wants to accuse you and deceive you of who you truly are because he knows once you know who you are, you're unstoppable. You're getting it this morning. The third thing that we see in 
this uh, passage of scripture when Jesus was in the wilderness is the third temptation is this. And the third time the accuser lifted Jesus up into a very high mountain range and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all the splendors that go with it. Um, and then it says this, all of these kingdoms I will give to you, the accuser said, if only you kneel down before me and worship me. But Jesus said, go away, enemy, for the scriptures say, kneel before your Lord God only and worship him only. Kneel before the Lord your God and worship him only. You know, the third thing that I, I see here is that the enemy came in to tempt Jesus to, for, for an I mentality, to, to gain the riches of this world. You know, one thing I've noticed in a season of being in the wilderness is that there's always a, a, de, a divisive spirit that will come in to try and show the glamour of this world so that you'll turn away from what the kingdom of God has for you. You know, the scriptures say that you can't serve God God and mammon. Why? Because they're both gods that you would idolize in your life. You know, you can either serve building your own kingdom or you can serve building his kingdom. But the difference here is that when it becomes about building your kingdom, it's about you. And when it comes about building his kingdom, that's when you've died to self and you've surrendered everything. There's a very big difference. And the enemy comes in and he tries to show you the glamour, the things of this world, so that you will desire it because he knows that if you have it, then you're going to move away from the, the, from the Lord. So I want to hit this point. The point is this, is that God doesn't mind you having things. God minds when things have you. It's okay to steward and have things of great wealth. God wants you to be blessed people. And obviously, if you're blessed, that doesn't define your identity or it doesn't give your value. Your value is in Christ Jesus. You know, you're valuable across the board wherever you sit. But the truth is, is that you can have nice things, but it can't have you. The enemy wants it to have you so that you behold it and you worship it over worshiping and loving the Lord. You know, I feel like this morning that some of us need to do some reflection and think, have I been chasing the things of this world or have I been building the kingdom of God? Have I been chasing things for my own riches and my own glory that I will be seen, known, that I would be adored? Or are you abiding in him and surrendering and allowing your identity and worth to come from the Lord? Am I speaking to someone this morning? We need to break the I mentality in our life. We can't do it. You know, I see this amazing man of God in the Old Testament. We see Daniel. Uh, he's a prophetic voice, and he walked closely with Nebuchadnezzar. He work, walked closely with kings of that time. And he didn't desire the cup or the food uh, from Nebuchadnezzar because he knew that he had to abide in what comes from the Lord. He knew that he could be there for, for ministry. He could be there to go ahead and, and, and on assignment, but he couldn't partake of the cup. He could not desire the cup because if he desired the cup, then what would happen is that his gaze would be turned away from the true assignments. You know, some of us are called to preach to the wealthy and the people of this world that have great things. But the moment that you step in and you desire what they have is the moment that you'll lose connectivity to what God has placed you there for. The same applies in this world. How can we be a voice and be a voice of revival in this time if we're jealous of what the world is having? We need to disconnect from this. It can't be a part of us. We have to walk in a reality where it's Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus crucified. That's our only message. That's our only heart. It's the only thing that we pursue. And everything that we do build and establish is so that he could be glorified. You guys getting me this morning? I thank you, Lord. I, I find that what's quite profound as well in this passage of Scripture is we see in verse 11, it says, At once the accuser left him and the angel suddenly gathered around Jesus to minister to his needs. I find this so profound because Jesus was one that was in the midst of community. He was in the midst of being in a gathering. What the enemy does in a time where we're in a wilderness season that we're running through is that he wants to bring isolation to separate you from people. Who knows that people sharpen you? Who knows that being in community is important and being committed to community is important? If you're a lone ranger, you've missed the revelation of Jesus. Jesus loved people and he was always amongst people. 
There was moments that he turned away to go and pray, but that's so that he could be filled, re-energized, and receive the word and the assignment of the Lord. We need to be in community. We can't be isolated. The enemy wants to isolate you because he knows if he can lock you up in your own thoughts and give you thoughts, then he's won. He's brought you into captivity. We need to be people at all costs that pursue fellowship. You know, when I was um, several months ago, actually, no, this was about a year ago, we used to do meetings in our house, and we called it Fireplace. And it was just out of a heart of like, hey, we want to gather people that are radical for Jesus that we can do life with. It was blessed and ordained by our church. We're like, hey, we just want to gather people and go deep in the things of God. We want to have no agenda but just to worship and pursue Jesus. And so we had these gatherings in our house, and we would just spend time with the Lord, and God would roll up in the most beautiful way because of the unity that we established. God's highest goal in the realm of the kingdom is family and connection. Because in family and connection, all things flow. All things have grace. Where there's disunity, that's the work of the enemy. God doesn't want to divide people. He wants to unify people in the truth of the gospel. You know, we see in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room. They got tongues of fire on the top of their head. And the revelation that I see is it came on their head, not in front of them. So they wouldn't say, look how great my fire is. But they would have to look at their brother and sister and say, wow, look how amazing your fire is. The Holy Spirit brings unity. Wherever the Holy Spirit is made manifest, unity comes. And so we had these fireplace meetings and we just pursued the things of God and did life together. Uh, we have a, I don't know if you guys have Wawa here, but Wawa changed my life. It's a gas station. They do hoagies and stuff. We don't have it in Australia. It's amazing. So we get Wawa and hang out and just pray together and contend. And I remember one night the Lord spoke to me and said, Jack, because of the unity that you've established in this place, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. And so I was like, Lord, okay, cool. We're just going to press in and see what happens. And we, we had some people that were fairly new believers and some people that came to our house that walked away from God and they were trying to rededicate their life to the Lord. And we just went all in together at any cost. We wanted to pursue the face of Jesus. And as we're there just worshiping, the power of God falls in our home and people start to get delivered and no one lays hands on them. I remember that night where one gentleman started manifesting an evil spirit, a demon, and I ran over to him to start to cast this thing out. And by the time that I got there, he hit the floor and the demon left him and he was completely set free. There's something that's powerful that happens when we're unified. In a wilderness season, we must be unified. You know, God can speak to us in so many ways, through visions, through dreams, through nudges, impressions, feelings. But one of the ways that the Lord speaks to us is through community. Sometimes we can be so blinded by what God is releasing in this hour because we don't have an outside opinion of someone that carries the heart of God. On the other hand, who is your community? Who are you hanging out with? You know, because you're the average of the, the five people that you hang out with. Are you hanging out with people that are on fire for Jesus? Are you hanging out with people that will sharpen you, that will encourage you to go deep in the things of the Lord? Or are you hanging out with people that will draw you away from the face of God? Can I get the keys on the, um, on the keyboard, the key player on the keyboard? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You know, there was a girl that came to our meeting in, in, uh, in Philadelphia, our fireplace meeting in our house, and she, she sat there, and I, I remember this so clearly, but she was in the midst of community, and she was just pursuing Jesus. And she just starts to weep powerfully. Like, she just starts crying in the glory and the presence of the Lord. Afterwards, she says, I've never felt love from a father like this before. God wants to demonstrate his love and his affection through community. God loves community. God wants to speak to you and breathe upon you in community. God wants to speak and breathe upon you in intimacy with Him. Corporately, we need to go up with Him. Amen. Corporately, we need to pursue Him. But also, personally, you have to pursue Him. No, if you make history with God, He'll make history through you. Would you stand to your feet? I, I want to pray over you. Thank you, Lord. You know, I feel in my spirit, and you can lift your hands to heaven.
And as I'm speaking, worship team, if you even want to come up and we'll just enter this time of worship. But I feel in my spirit that there's some of us that have found ourselves in a wilderness season and we're desperately seeking for a breakthrough. We're desperately seeking for God to speak, for God to fill us. We're desperately seeking for community. We're desperately seeking for freedom. And I just felt in my heart this morning that God wanted to release freedom in the midst of surrender. That as we say, God, it's not in my strength, it's not in my ability, it's not in what I can work up, but it's in your spirit, it's in your power. I believe that in that heart posture of surrender, I felt like the Lord was going to touch and fill us this morning. That we would be filled with a confidence, that we would be filled with a boldness in our God. That you would know that your God has never left you. He's never forsaken you, but He's been near every moment, every situation, every circumstance. God has been near. He's never left you. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows exactly the challenges that you're facing, but He wants to give you a brand new life. He wants to give you a brand new perspective. And so if that's you this morning that you're like, man, I just need a filling of God. I just need a moment of surrender. I need a moment where I can ask God and, and I, can, I can repent of doing things in my own strength and doing things away from community. I need to repent for doing things with myself in mind instead of the kingdom. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit will fill you. Like when I was six years old in my bedroom and the Lord came in and filled me and transformed me. And so if that's you today, with every eye closed, I just want you to raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So right now, we're going to go into this song of worship, and I want you to go deep in surrendering to the Lord. And then I'm going to come back up, and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that the power of God will fill you and transform you. And so let's just worship. Let's adore Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
we bless you this morning. Father, we thank you for every single person that said, God, I surrender all. God, I surrender everything. Father, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that you would fill every heart, every heart, God. Father, I pray that your power would come and shift and transform and make new. Father, I pray that you would begin to mold and bend and melt, God, and transform. Father, I pray right now that you would give us the filling of the Holy Ghost. The Father, that no matter what season, no matter what circumstance, no matter what we find ourselves in, God, I pray that you would fill us with a confidence and a boldness in you. Father, that you would fill us with your spirit and with your power. God, that we would remain in connection and unity with you, Lord. Father, I pray that today, that as we leave this place, that we would walk in encounter. We would walk in nearness of you. The Holy Spirit, it would almost be like you would rest as a dove on our shoulders. And we would be aware of you. That we would be careful of what we do, what we say, what we're, what we're stepping into. That we wouldn't shake you, Holy Spirit, off our shoulder. Lord, that we'd be so aware of your presence and your nearness. And so, Lord, right now, fill every heart, fill every heart in Jesus' name. I feel like in my spirit that some of you guys have been contending for freedom. And I believe that today's the day that chains are being broken off your life. Mindsets are being shifted. Heart postures are being changed. Hard hearts are turning into a, a soft heart. That today would be the day that you would re-establish connectivity to God. Because it's only in that place, my friends, it's only in that place that you can live a life fulfilled. When your gaze is upon Jesus. Come on, lift your hands to heaven. I want you to pray a personal prayer to the Lord. I want you to ask God, God, would you come? Would you fill me? Would you reveal your truth to me this morning? God, would you remove the things that need to be removed? And God, would you instill the things that need to be instilled? Come on, let's worship, pray, and ask the Lord to fill you. Lord, I thank you that your arms are stretched out, God. Lord, I thank you, Father, that those who call upon your name, Lord, you receive. God, that you don't turn anyone away. Father, God, even in our wilderness, Lord, that when we cry out to you, Lord, you are there. Lord, as David says, on the mountaintop, in the valley, even in the depths of Hades, Lord, your presence defines us. Lord, I thank you, God, that you're always near. God, I honor you. Lord, we thank you so much for your word this morning, Father. Lord, I thank you for the work that it's doing in our hearts right now, God, and the work that it's going to continue to do through the weeks and the days that we live in our life. Lord, we honor you today. God, we honor your presence. Lord, we honor your love and your goodness and your openness to us, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are the creator of the universe, but you are called us your own and gave us the privilege to call you our father you gave us the privilege to enjoy your presence god we thank you father 
we give you honor and praise in Jesus name amen 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 God is good unfortunately our service is concluded God's presence is so good and sometimes you just don't want to leave but you don't have to go you know as uh, Jack was saying you know there's power in community in unity with one another right Holy Spirit is among us so we have a per perfect opportunity for community cafe is open banquet hall is open you don't have to go we can stay we can fellowship and be in community with one another so God bless you guys God bless your week wherever you find yourself Jack thank you so much for a wonderful word blessings to you guys your wife your family your ministry safe travels back to Philly we will be praying for you guys as well uh, wonderful time with you today as we always say my dear friends as we close change your world all right god bless you